Remember, pray for him if you would. And then um, say that Mike Bryant's back in the hospital. He's home from the hospital. Okay. Everything's going good now. Thank you, Lord. And live stream, appreciate y'all picking up on us. And, and uh, thank y'all for coming in. Appreciate that. And, and um, Miss uh, Lena wanted us to pray for her um, sister, uh, May, Miss May, 94 years of age. I believe it has been in, uh, up there at uh, Hartwell Nursing Home for a few years now. But she's at the Livonia Hospital right now, and they are uh, having to put on oxygen, having a hard time breathing. And so Miss Lena wanted us to remember to pray for her, for her if we would, her Aunt May, her sister May. And um, so remember to pray for her if you would, and trust that God's will will be done. And in her life, she has that Alzheimer's dementia pretty bad, and so uh, it ought to just help all that to, to clear up in a good way for his will. And uh, thank God for that. And um, I told we um, didn't get to see Jimmy um, Dove, but I told his wife yesterday, you know, she, he's been on the list for a good while that we were praying for to have a stroke, and she said he's doing real good. And uh, so thank the Lord that, that uh, Jimmy Dove is right across the street here is doing good after um, his um, stroke. But, no, uh, he just had that same uh, surgery that I had, he had his what about a year or so ago, but um, but he's having to take radiation, all of that as well, because that cancer, uh, didn't chemo tablets or different things, uh, the cancer they didn't weren't able to get it all, and uh, so he had to take radiation and different things. So, but um, but he does seem to be doing all right, thank the Lord, and he does us to keep praying for him and. Um, that God will work in, in all of these situations according to his will and what he knows is best in each situation. And um, we we'll thank him for it. And so uh, Miss Gail's going to do some therapy on her back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So keep praying for that. But, uh, and again, I'm not made to catch Mark Brown up the road. I've tried several times and can't ever catch him. But I uh, hope he's doing all right. And pray for them if you would. And um, here's your sister-in-law, Miss Barbara, and her niece. They coping any better? It's still real hard on them. And uh, Brady Hugh, uh, Miss Elaine, texted where to go and said that Brother Hugh is having uh, a lot of pain and and he's thinking about becoming his kidney. So uh, I think he has a doctor's appointment uh, this week and try to get in and see about that. So uh, pray for that if you would, please. And speaking of which, I've uh, just come across my mind again. Uh, I talked to uh, Brother Fabian. He said it's going to be way too cold to try to work on putting any shoe rock up there. I think it's supposed to be like, I think Brother Lyle said he looked for what, seven degrees? Seven degrees on Saturday morning. So uh, Brother Fabian said, I think that'd be a little too cold to try to get in there and, and hang any uh, sheetrock or whatnot. So uh, we're going to have to postpone it because I think it might be a little rainy or uh, snowy. It won't be no rain if it's anywhere close to that. Uh, there would be ice or something, sure in the world. So um, we just postpone that uh, up there. But we, uh, so that would be mighty cold. I know we went up Monday and, and helped them out a little bit and enjoyed it. It was cold enough then. So I could imagine trying to work in that thing when it's down in the teens. It would be sure enough rough going for some of us folks anyhow, but thank y'all for those who's willing to go and help it. He, he was so disappointed. He said, man, I already had things figured out what we could get done and all of that. We had a couple of extra hands, but uh, maybe we'll get up there before too long and, and uh, pray for that if you would. So any others then before we uh, go, Lord, in prayer for these particular things. And Ms. Owens? Really, Monday? Okay. We're not need there. Anybody else think of got anything else that we can? Start in home. I text them and try to see if I can get by to see them. I hadn't heard back from them.
Really? No. Why? Uh, That's the leper's um, niece's husband, right? Or they had, um, had it was on that cruise ship. And, uh, the previous uh, Troy that he had a, some kind of disease, infection, got in and right on that. So, right. Picking up somebody with it, man. Uh, pray, pray for this um, young man, Troy. That hopefully, things will clear up with him in a good way. And, uh, anybody else? Man. Brady, Brady was in a in a wreck. Mm. I'm just Brady, man. Young fellows in a wreck. Man, we got Grayson. Probably that right young man. Got to help him. And, and my ne uh, nephew's son, appreciate y'all praying for him. He's home and miraculously doing good physically. You know, we're still praying God to work in his heart um, to get his attention. Um, but God, but trust God, you let God have that part of his life. But physically, it's just amazing how he's recovered. But pray God to work in his heart as well. For that car accident. Well, thank y'all for praying for that. Brother Green? Okay. Mm. Okay, that was your, your sister in law, right? That's what I think she was your sister in law. Mm. Right. Mm. But she is home, though. Home from, from the Spinal Center. And that's a blessing, I'm sure. It's a big blessing. Mm. Where's one warning them, dude? I didn't get the phone call. <laughs> I didn't get the phone call, did you really? Oh, man. No, I didn't get that phone call, so I reckon Grace Park, why I didn't know that, Phillips? Man. <laughs> mm. Really? Wow. Man, a Phillips family? I heard that uh, I was stopped by Joe Bowman's station the other day, and they, he told me that um, Charles's daddy died. Have you all heard that? I don't know what Charles, what his daddy's name would have been. Harry Norton. But I heard it. Mm. Mm. Has he already buried him? Really? I can't. I asked Mr. Joe. I said, "Do you know when he, anything? I like go to visitation." And Mr. Joe said, "I didn't know, I don't know anything." And that was yesterday. I thought it might have been, might have been uh, Monday. Monday over there, yeah, Monday, wasn't it? Oh, so he buried him. I hate that. I didn't get a chance to go by and, and to see Charles for that. Anybody else got anything that we can? Duncan. Really? Duncan family as well. 
That's quite a few. They have sadly say right here close. I mean, uh, all these y'all mentioned tonight. Really? Oh, by our house? Yeah. Those, those duckers? This boy, that, that's not one who's dead, is it? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, if it's that couple that works with you. Yeah. Right? Okay. So so that's the Duncans that live there on uh, on that road? I ain't even seen any funeral signs or nothing out there, huh? I don't know. They, they, they are the Rousey Duncan Road. They are Duncan. Hmm. Why? Well, I, I, On, uh, yeah, they got two or three Duncan brothers that live there on that Rousey Duncan Road right there. Mm. Uh, hey, again, for that, again, if I know something, I know the family and I gave it to go by there, I, it bothers me, but no, I, uh, I, um, mm. pray for them. Anybody else got anything tonight that we can, can pray with y'all about? And, uh, Brother Reynolds, I didn't, I didn't think to ask him. I just texted uh, John Reynolds yesterday and and told him, you know, I had you in my mind praying for you, Doc. And he said, I appreciate it. I said we're uh, on on our way, flying into New York and fis and then heading out to Israel tonight. And uh, so they're taking, there he's flying over to Israel. Yeah, I didn't even think about it after I hung up again. I'm going to text him a while down, and I got thinking about it. You know, I didn't even think to ask him, but apparently everything's all right. <laughs> Already in Tel Aviv. Wow. So, uh, uh, again, you, don't, you, you can't stop those Israelis. They're going <laughs> to, I know whenever we're over there, people say, you didn't feel threatened. I feel safer there than I do here in the United States. Because they're where you want. Uh, of course, they had that massive shooting there, but they probably picked a spot somewhere or another where they didn't have a lot of Israeli soldiers. Because everywhere where they're tourists, man, they got Israeli soldiers all around you uh, with those tourist groups. I mean, walk around there, machine gun, whatever they call those things. Uh, and those tourist groups are there. Uh, you know, they got you covered big time, <laughs> big time. But uh, so they're in Tel Aviv now then. Okay, then. They must have... Uh, had a good flight then. He may have got a prayer request, and we'll go, Lord, and pray for these. And uh, ask God to meet with us and encourage our hearts. Father, we do thank you again for this seat. I know it's a cold night, but Lord, I pray to some boys and girls that anything to ask but allow if any of the kids came on the band tonight, but we sure trust they did. And God may be reminded to them to be ready on Sunday. And as Brother Todd and we keep talking, it's just going to take a continual effort hopefully to get them in the routine or get them ready and, and once they ever get up and get coming god i believe that on sunday mornings it, it would uh, be a big encouragement for them to keep doing so so god just please encourage our hearts we trust there's some that they were to make it tonight and and bless the work down there to god and we thank you for uh keeping the pipes and everything and as far as i know everybody in the church no problems at all and none here at the church itself that i know of yet dear lord and thank you for just taking care of all that and everybody's safe in, in every aspect of traveling and back and forth in every way. And, Lord, thank you to that school nurse after that brain surgery was able to be back at work today. And, Lord, just uh, bless and encourage that. And, again, I thank you for uh, the schools like Dangersville there where Bev said that, Lord, you've given such good, godly, I think, principals and uh, teachers that, that really encourage prayer for each other. I know even whenever... Uh, I, you know, slipped back, went back by there after my surgery and saw Beth, you know, went in there with her and how many of the principals and different ones were just saying they were praying for us. And, Lord, thank you for those that, that are still in good schools that they're praying for each other and, and holding up the banner of the cross in the way that they possibly can. And thank you for those that are willing to do that, Lord, and that she's back home and, and doing better, and we just praise you for that. And, 
And Lord, we just uh, thank you that uh, you'd help uh, Robbie, my nephew's son, Spencer, to do better physically. Lord, and he's improved such a tremendous progress. But Lord, pray you work in his heart in a great way. And we sure would thank you for that, God. And this young man that Beth mentioned that uh, was in another serious car wreck, that uh, Brady, I believe it might have been, Lord, that you're working this man's physical body. And Lord, you'd help him. And bring him up to a good healing and uh, Lord again minister to their family and their lives spiritually and the blessing that that would be in the, to them dear God also and sure would thank you for what you do there for them and think about uh, the old one's grandson Jeremy Lord uh, again it's been a blessing all the years that you've allowed me to just get to know him being around preacher Miss Owens and the times that Jeremy would would help out here in the building and God even come over to the house a couple of times and shot skeets and things like that and lord i just pray that you'd help this young man and that you would do a, a, a tremendous work in his life physically and otherwise and i'm sure that preacher mrs owens would would give so much praise back to you and uh so lord we commit in a great way to you that you'd work there and and how we thank you for what you would do and god for the special uh, need that we were just talking with before the church service time tonight and that God will um, we'll see you working in that situation, in that family, in a tremendous way as well, God, and and accomplishing so much. And we sure would thank you for again showing yourself strong and mighty out of that family situation, Lord. And we think about our uh, brother Chris Smith, uh, Miss Tina, Lord. I think she had to have some injections in her back the other day, and uh, for the pain and stuff. But like brother Curtis has to go through. Uh, I believe Miss Tina has to go through a lot of that same similar pain injections in her back. And Lord, just pray you'd help her and help Brother Chris and not been feeling good. That God, you'd touch his body and raise him up, please. And Lord, just again, help us to uh, send him a message and let him know that we're thinking about him and praying for him, God. That uh, they just, again, they won't be back. They just physically are unable to do so right now. But Lord, uh, bless and encourage their hearts, and we sure would praise what you accomplished there for them, dear God. And think about this, uh, Ms. Rose is taking radiation, and now I think I've understood, Brother Anthony Wright, maybe got her spaced out and trying something maybe a little bit different that you'd work there and uh, in her behalf. And Lord, we think about uh, Brother Green's uh, uh, sister-in-law, thinking she's home, uh, but Lord, we pray for the recovery that she has, and Lord, you administer there to her in a good way as well, and accomplish so much there in their life, dear God. And uh, Brother Roger's niece's husband, Troy, and the progress he's making, and God working his heart as well, and pray that you would help him to um, Lord, see you at work and his need for you also, dear God. And Lord, we think about uh, the family that was with us on Sunday. We pray, thank you for uh, Brother Eddie and Miss Olivia inviting this couple to come be with them, visiting with them, and Pray, God, that you would just uh, encourage our hearts and it be your will that they'll be back and it would be a blessing there to God. And we thank you for it. Miss Owen's sister that had the surgery coming up here in, in a few days. And, uh, things go well there with her and also for the other special need that Mrs. Owen mentioned just now that, God, you were there in a good way. You know, so many that are uh, having to deal with the lost loved ones that, you just help them, God. The Duncan family, their God, and uh, Norton family, I believe it was, and another one that I believe Brother uh, Green mentioned that uh, the death in these families, and you just comfort and work with them and in a good way, please, also, dear God. And much thanks you go to you for that. And Brother Hugh, and this pain he's having, and Lord, you'd help that, please, to clear up and trust it won't be anything uh, dealing with that kidney. Uh, but, Lord, you just minister to Brother Hugh in a special way, and we thank you for it. And pray for Brother Curtis still and, and the um, heart procedure or test, whatever they're having to do to try to determine what to do to help Brother Curtis, that you would give them the, the wisdom and understanding. And please give his body the physical strength that he greatly needs every day just to get up and get going. What a blessing it is to me to see these that, Lord, it is a struggle. Where it's like Brother Curse, all the, the pain is back and the other problems he's having and preaching Miss Owens and so many God it just they put the effort forward to be here and thank you for it. And others, dear God, it is I get discouraged. 
when I think, man, it doesn't take much at all to keep them out of the house of God. But I sure get encouraged when I see those that and it takes an awful lot to get them out. And thank you for it, dear Lord. And so God just working everything, brother. Um, Roger and Miss Gail's uh, cousin there, Johnny, and the heart uh, pacemaker, and things go well and try and get that put in for Miss Lena's sister, Miss um, May. Uh, God is Miss Lena is praying, Lord, you know what's best, and uh, they don't want Miss May to have to just lay there and suffer and go through a lot of pain and different things or procedures. So God, but if you be gracious and know that you can restore back to good health. But God, again, they're trusting in your care, and uh, you know best. And uh, so help Miss May, God, and thank you for the years that you've given her for the testimony that she knows you as her Lord and Savior, and she's lived her life uh, as a lady of faith. And thank you for that testimony and minister there in a good way. And again, we'll praise you for it so much. And we do thank you, this Miss Phyllis. Like I said, Brother Green's sister-in-law is home. And making some progress as well and these others that are there in the nursing home and and other things that god you'd work in each one of those in a good way and accomplish everything for your purpose and your plan and we'll thank you and help our country that god you would help our leadership from the president down to lord our county uh, people that they would make every decision as good and right in every way and the thing about madison county and is looking for God, another school superintendent, that God, you give him a good godly person, please, to run that position. And think about the many counties, Hart County, Franklin County, I believe in Stevens County, but particularly right here around us at uh, Hart and Franklin that are elected a sheriff. Lord, you are a guy there. You know exactly, again, uh, who's best for that job. And pray that you put the right sheriff in those positions. And we'll thank you for everything you do for our communities. And Jesus' name, we pray and ask these things. Amen and amen. Oh. John, tonight again, we um, maybe touch us a moment or two on this um, thought of the um, the title, the Son of God. It's tremendous, tremendous thing, isn't it? Uh, and it's, an, it's a title that is, again, as we have said over and over and over, is most critical. You remember when uh, Philip was with the Ethiopian eunuch, and he had been preaching unto him Jesus, and they're going on that carriage, and they came to that uh, oasis out in the desert, and the Ethiopian eunuch said, Oh, behold, water, what did him be baptized? And Philip said to him, If thou believest, and uh, thou may be baptized. And you remember the testimony, the Ethiopian eunuch, what his response was? And the Ethiopian answered and said to him, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And uh, in the book of Acts, chapter 9, where they were going through preaching in the synagogues and preaching, it says they were preaching Christ. Everywhere they went, they preaching that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. So that message is critical, critical. You, you and I, we can't miss it. We can't miss it. Oh, man, it's very important, very important. Anybody check? I know we're talking about it Sunday night, but it, it's always that she did some looking up on it. How many times that singular phrase is used, the Son of God? Did anybody, I told Miss Owen, she, did, she still does it. The old school gives out the strong concordance, a big old book, by like an encyclopedia or something. Like you hit somebody over the head, we not break the neck. It was a big old strong concordance. I was so thankful. Boy, when I got smart enough to download a, a power lap on my phone, I, I think I threw my strong concordance in the trash. I mean, I said, Lord, I ain't got to sit and flip this thing pages and pages and, and cross reference this thing a, a million times. Now I just go to that phone app and type it in, and it pulls up my strong concordance. And I'm like, wow, man, that's so much better. Did anybody check that, um, how many times the singular phrase of Son of God is found in the New Testament? Anybody um, check that out? And if you got your phone app, you can Google it right fast. But uh, on the um, Bible app anyway, if, on your Bible app, 44 times when I, when I type in my Bible app, the Son of God, singular phrase, 44 times 
that phrase comes up. One time in the Old Testament, which we say the book of Daniel, and that included that one time in Luke that we talked about that, you know, was really an insert by the translators. But every, every time, you know, apart from that one time in Luke, that that phrase, you know, you find here in the King James translation, but the 43 times that that phrase is used in a single sense, it is only in reverence of Jesus Christ. As Brother Roger said, you, you know as the King James translated, they put all the sun in what, Brother Roger? Capital S. So, uh, so they were signifying that, they, that that phrase was set aside for the Son of God. Now, the plural use, the sons of God, the sons of God, when, again, I type it into my Strong's Concordance, it was used in the King James translation, the sons of God, 12 times. One time, one of those 12 times is in Hosea where it says the sons of the living God, but the same phrase, the sons of God. 12 times is that multiple sense used, the sons of God. But one time is that singular sense used, the Son of God, in reference to Jesus Christ. And anybody got a comment on that before we move on to another title that's given to us here in the book of John about Jesus Christ? Anybody got a comment or a thought about this title, the Son of God, given to Jesus? Isn't it amazing, again, that's what the devil said? That they knew who he was. Uh, they, they knew he was the Son of God. And uh, just, oh, man, I've been hearing a lot of preachers, old messages I listen to, uh, one. They've been talking a lot here lately about that phrase I've been messing with to again about how much it identified Jesus as God. And uh, what an amazing thought. Well, if you don't have any comment, then we look at another title in the book of John. So that's the last one in the first chapter of John that I remember uh, that we haven't looked at. Does anybody have a note that you have marked that there's another title in the book, the first chapter? that maybe we have not covered, but I believe that we've covered every title, and there's a bunch of them. Good grand, I think, there's, man, there was about 11 or so in that first chapter alone. But uh, the second chapter and, and, and the most of the third chapter is just a repeat of some of the titles. You'll find them in that second, third chapter, some titles that we've already looked at. But the, the, the next title in, in chapter 3 that's given to uh, the Lord the, the first time we find it here in the book of John. So in the third chapter, begin look in verse number 26. John chapter 3 in verse 26. And again, this is a, another uh, conversation that's, that's taking place between John the Baptist and some of the Jewish people. And so here in this third chapter, verse 26, is again, John the Baptist and some Jews are going at it, or really some of his disciples as well, John's followers. But verse 26, And they came unto John and said to him, Rabbi, he that was with thee beyond Jordan, to him thou bearest witness, to whom thou bearest witness, Behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given him from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom which standeth and heareth him rejoiceth greatly because of the, of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. That title that John gave him, the bridegroom, the bridegroom. Before we get thinking too much about that title, just notice here again, and you, we didn't read the, the first uh, three or four verses uh, prior to, to verse 26 that was going on between these Jews and uh, John the Baptist and some of John the Baptist's followers. But here you find these folk, there always would be some people that just want to stir up a division. They can't stand for things to be going good. 
they got to find something to stir up some problems about. So, boy, here was, boy, things were going great. John the Bad boy, God had been greatly using him. Then God brought Jesus on the scene and come his time. And, boy, Jesus began to make his ministry known. He has just performed this miracle in the second chapter about, you know, uh, at the marriage feast and these things that Jesus had done. And things are going great. And here the folk come. And you notice what they said to, Mo, to John the Baptist, Rabbi. They're trying to flatter them. The Proverbs warns you about folk with, with false flattery. And they're trying to stir up some division. Because they were calling Jesus Rabbi, the master teacher. Come, we found the Rabbi, the master teacher. So now they come and they're saying to John, hey, you're the master teacher, John. You know that one whom you said, have talked about, he's baptizing more folk than you are. He's got a bigger crowd following him. Everybody's left you, John. And now they're following that man you're talking about. They're trying to stir up a problem. Trying to bring that old uh, monster of jealousy to the heart of John, the Baptist. And again, we got to watch folk for doing that. Man, the devil, he loves to cause division and accuse the brethren. And so here his crowd comes on the scene. They could care less about who was following them. They just wanted to make John and Jesus have contentions against each other and not work together in what God had called them to do. But I, I am so thankful to John. He didn't waver one bit. I mean, he, he didn't bat an eye. When they come and say, hey, he's got more people following you, John said, praise God, that's what he's supposed to be doing in essence. Look at what John said there to him he would, in uh, verse number 28. Ye yourselves bear me witness. In other words, he said, y'all heard me say that I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He said, y'all heard me say I am not the, the Christ. I'm not the main man. That is somebody else. Y'all heard me say that, he said. In verse number um, well, 30, John says, he must increase, but I must decrease. And he goes, you know, he said that, boy, he that come uh, before me, after me, was preferred before me, whose shoe lashes I'm not worthy to lose. So it is important how we deal with things about jealousy. If we realize we're not anything that important, if we don't get the big head about ourselves, it's hard to get jealous, isn't it? Most problems with jealousy come because we got an eye problem. We think we're something. If, if we could keep the same perspective about John, you can't get jealous like that when you realize, man, so what? I, I don't deserve it anyhow. I don't deserve it. So, man, what, what's the big deal? You're trying to tell me to get upset about what somebody else is doing? Man, thank God they're doing it. That God is blessing them and going on with it. But the problem comes most of the time we get thinking too much about ourselves and then we get jealous because somebody's getting something that we think we deserve. Something that we think we had a right to. And uh, so we have to um, ask God to help us with that and guard through that. But John made this amazing statement in this title, verse 29 again. He that hath the bridegroom, the, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. He's speaking a volume of truth, but it seems almost sarcastic. He didn't have to bride the bridegroom. Nah. I mean, you think that that would be pretty well understood. It would be hard to be a bride without a groom. <laughs> it's hard to be a bridegroom or groom without a bride. So for John to say that he didn't have to bride as a bridegroom, he just again reemphasizing the fact. They're supposed to be going after the bridegroom. I'm just a friend of the bridegroom. I mean, I, the bride better not marry me. <laughs> Dude, she married the wrong fella. I mean, if I'm the best man in somebody's wedding, and that bride comes over and grabs my hand and tries to slip, boy, one thing, not I'm, I'm married. But if I wasn't married, and, and uh, the, the different ones that I've served as best man in over the years of my life, Boy, it would been pretty bad if I was standing there and the bride come up and all of a sudden wanted to say, I do to me. 
That's just not where it is. So John is emphasizing the tremendous truth. The bride belongs to the bridegroom, not to anybody else. Isn't that a tremendous fundamental truth? If we would understand, and, and that's a principle that's being taught throughout the Word of God, is that the bride belongs to the bridegroom. But our whole mentality, and it has been since the foundation of the world, that God would deal with Israel as rebellious bride. And, uh, and how many times did God have to tell us, you know, you belong to Christ. Know you not you've been bought with a price? Therefore glorify God in your body. You're his. You don't, if you're not married to Satan. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. He ought to be ours. And again, our, the, the, whenever John's making this statement, uh, it's, it's amazing thought is the fact that uh, our culture is different. You know, the, in our culture, uh, who's the, the, the highlight of a wedding? The bride, ain't the yeah. I mean, the rest of the folk, we come, we stand up here, we're standing here. And you got that groom, and you got the best man, and two or three other folk, and you got all the bride man. We standing here. But what is everybody waiting on? That bride coming, they waiting on that, what do you call that thing y'all play? Wedding march. Wedding march. I thought you had a fancy name for it. <laughs> I thought it was something fancy y'all called it. <laughs> the wedding ball. But they waiting on that done and all, whatever, and everybody's bought Turn around and look. That's the grand, what they're looking for. That's not the biblical way. We know that. And we, we got it backwards. The biblical culture, and in, still in many of the Eastern cultures today, the bride is not high. She's standing there waiting like the groom. He's standing at the altar waiting. And everybody's waiting for the groom, the bridegroom, to make his grand entrance. That was a biblical way, the biblical perspective of weddings. And again, it is much in Eastern culture now. That the bride is waiting and everybody looking, where's the groom? Where's he at? And looking for him. And so get that picture of mine. Don't get in the picture of the mind of our weddings here in, in the United States. We do it with the bride, with the groom. The bride is a sinner, rightfully so. And uh, but that's what we're looking for. I mean, man, y'all remember the days us men that got married, we were standing there looking, anticipating? I mean, the old custom was you weren't supposed to see her in her wedding dress, uh, you know, until that day she walked through that door. And uh, so we, uh, Beth and I, we held to that tradition. And uh, so we were anticipating well, what she's going to look like in that wedding dress when they come in that back door. But reverse that if you can. And understand the, the biblical culture of a bridegroom and bride. She is standing here waiting for the back door to open for the bridegroom to come in. So many thoughts with, with that uh, aspect of it. We've got some things that I've jotted down here, but uh, to share with about that. You know, Jesus uh, referred to himself as the, uh, the bridegroom. Somebody look at Matthew 9, 15 for me. 9, 15. Where Jesus referred to himself as the bridegroom. Somebody got it, Brother Anthony? Matthew 9, 15. So Jesus referred himself as the bridegroom in the bridegroom. Before I share a couple of thoughts I have on this, uh, what is a, a tremendous truth about what John was saying when he identified him as the, the bridegroom and when Jesus took this title upon himself. Uh, any of y'all got any thoughts about it? Anything that you come to your mind as you think about Christ being called the bridegroom, that title that's given to him? I'll give you a little bit longer children then while I share some of the things I thought about. I believe that when John gave this title to Jesus, when they said, hey, don't you know that all men are going after him? And John said, he'd have had the bride as a bridegroom. 
any religious-minded Jew, even though they denied Jesus, if they understood the Old Jewish uh, Testament, the Old Testament, they understood that number of times, multiple times, Israel is referred to in the Old Testament as whose wife? God, the wife of Jehovah. Throughout the Old Testament, God made that correlation. You are my wife. You played a harlot. But you're my wife. And God would make it very clear throughout Israel that they were the wife of Jehovah, Lord God Almighty, that he was their husband. So when John and these folks said, hey, everybody's going after him, John said, he's the bridegroom. I would imagine any Jewish thinking person meeting new John and saying, wait a minute. We belong to Jehovah. And John said, I know, there he is right there. There he is right there. He's the bridegroom. The bride belongs to him, to the bridegroom. He is the bridegroom. You better go after him, Israel. You better pack up and follow your bridegroom. That's who you belong to. So when I got looking and praying on this thing, I think the first thing God showed me was John once again was accepting the fact he is the Lord God Jehovah that Israel belongs to. He's the bridegroom. The, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. He has the bride of Israel. They belong to him. He is the Lord God of Jehovah of the Old Testament. That's one aspect that grabbed my heart. And let's just, uh, let me give you a verse. Uh, somebody got Isaiah 62, 5. Isaiah 62, 5. This is a great verse about the bridegroom of the Old Testament. Isaiah 62 and verse number 5. Somebody got, got it, Brother Green? You see that, com that comparison? He said, as that bridegroom, the Lord thy God, thy God, shall rejoice over you. And so when John said that, it's about that time when he said the Son of God, they knew that that was going back to Daniel. When Daniel said there was a third man and the fourth man in the fiery furnace, as unto it looked like, as was the Son of God, have his word, it was the Son of God. They knew when John said the Son of God, that that was the Old Testament prophecy. When he said the bridegroom, I believe they knew, hey, Isaiah prophets had said that as the bridegroom, your God has you. He was saying this is the God that Israel belongs to. That's just a thought that grabbed me. Another thought that came to my mind as I was thinking about this title and the significant truth about it, he that hath the bride is the bridegroom. Christ compared himself to be the bridegroom. It indicates another aspect of it. That since Israel had rejected him, and he was coming on the scene, and Israel had turned their back and played the harlot on their groomsman, on their husband, Jesus is going to turn, he's going to draw my bride out of the Gentile and Jews alike. He's going to not only just, is Israel going, will be the bride. Now he's saying, I'm going to be the bridegroom. I'm going to pull me out, folk, from every nation, tongue, and kindred all over this world. I will be the nation, uh, the, the uh, bridegroom to people from all over the, every nation of the world. And we know that again from Ephesians chapter number 5, don't we? In Ephesians 5, it, it talks so much about Christ and his uh, relationship as uh, the bridegroom to the church. In Ephesians 5, 22, Husbands, love your wives in as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present unto himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle in any such thing, but it should be holy and without blemish. 
So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord of the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 31, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. But look at verse 32 now. This is a great mystery. By speak concerning Christ and the church. So he was, when he gave this title and Jesus assumed it upon himself at various times as being the bridegroom, he is signifying, I am going to call out more people from all over the, this world. It's going to be a part of this bride. It's going to come to me. And he is calling out, sending out an invitation, an engagement, and people to accept it. And he's building that church, that bride that we read about in the book of Revelation. And, and boy, if, again, if you do much studying, sometimes, like somebody said about Paul, much studying made you mad. <laughs> I'm saying, if you, if you don't watch it, much study will make you mad uh, on studying things. But folk get wanting to split hairs over so many different things. Boy, living man, you're a dispensationist, or you are this. I've got all them things we're called. I just, I just finally got it. Well, I just, I'm a biblicalist. I just believe the Bible. You, I, you know, I'm a dispensation. I just preach what you talking about. I hope you don't ever know. But most of that stuff is nothing but a division on a lot of different things and whatnot. So they split hairs in that revelation where it says the bride has made her ready, herself ready. Boy, you get studying these Bible schools and all that. They're trying to split their head. Now, is that the bride, the, the Old Testament Israel? Or is it the new Gentile church? And is somebody going to be just a guest at this here wedding at the thing? I have no idea on the fact that I know without having, like I said Sunday, I'm learning a little bit more at 60 years old, not to add to, just take what it says. The bride has made herself ready. Israel is called the wife of Jehovah. So if you want to say she's a part of that, I ain't got a bit of problem. She is the wife of Jehovah. God made it very clear he's going to draw Israel back to himself. He said to Hosea, he said, you're going to marry that harlot. You go back and you buy her off the auction block because one day I'm going to bring Israel back and she will be my wife and she will be true and faithful to me. He's going to do that in tribulation period. So she may, she may be there. And another thing I know for certain is that Jesus is the bridegroom and I belong to Jesus. Amen. So that's good enough for me. So Israel is the bride of Jehovah and Jesus is Jehovah. They're all the Godhead. So the Jehovah Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit, they are the Godhead. Israel belongs to them. When it says that Jesus is the bridegroom, then my friend, the whole Godhead consists of the bridegroom because they do everything together, everything together. So who that bride going to be in the book of Revelation is going to be yes. It's going to be those who know the Lord Jesus Christ and put their faith and trust in him. He has is the bridegroom, and I know him, so I don't have much hesitation. I believe I'm going to be in that marriage feast there in the book of Revelation because we are part of the bridegroom. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. So he's, he's pulling us out, and Christ is there. But let's, this title, one more thought that I have here about the bridegroom. It is a truth that, again, is going to see fulfilled throughout the rest of the New Testament. You know what we said about the, the bridegroom and, and the right opposite of us? We sitting there and I remember whispering over to Fabian and then when we were up there at camp, I said, uh, there was a little bit of delay after uh, Emily didn't come in as her, what do you call them, major honor, what they call them thing. The Emily didn't come in, you know, and then and came in and, and they shut that thing back there, a little curtain thing back there in the back and laid on the toe five. And I said, I paid Ashley $100 to leave town. 
you know, she ain't coming. She ain't going to show up. We're just right or whatever. She ain't going to come. But everybody's looking back. And again, we said they're waiting. Is she going to never come through? You ever been to one and boy, so like, boy, you really wanted this? She really leave? I mean, man, it's taking her so long to come through to think and whatnot. Did she really leave or whatnot? Is she coming? And I told Emily, uh, Emily, I asked, I said, we can leave, girl. I said, uh, it won't take nothing to walk out this back door. These folks didn't pay anything to come in the first place. So, uh, and with me and your mom just be out of the money we paid to get this thing ready. We need to leave and not walk through that veil. But she didn't agree to it. She was ready to walk through it and come on down and whatnot. But they all, again, were waiting. When John said, the bridegroom, it was, again, the Jewish culture. You better be standing here waiting. Not for the bride, but for the groom. You better be ready. And that is a truth that is taught throughout the rest of the New Testament. Look, if you would, in Matthew 25. Matthew 25, again, and Jesus is using this title to describe himself. In Matthew 25, Jesus is speaking, and he says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise, and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slept and slumbered. See, he's used this analogy to, about the bridegroom. You know when he's going to come. And at midnight, there was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, and answered saying, not so, lest there be not enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell. They must have had a Walmart over 24 hours <laughs> at midnight. Go rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. So when we think about this title, the bridegroom given to Jesus Christ, we need to keep in our perspective. He's tarrying. But when he comes, he'll come and it'll be over. And how urgently we need to encourage ourselves to be ready in many ways. He's coming in essence for the church, these five virgins. The Word of God tells in, in the book of uh, Ephesians, perhaps somewhere in one of those letters, I believe it was the Apostle Paul was saying, I, I want to present you a chaste virgin, a spouse to Christ. When he comes, he wants to find us pure to him, given to him belonging to him and there'll be some that won't be ready that they have rejected his proposal and it'll be forever too late so the bridegroom is an amazing title that again describes not only the fact that we belong to him he didn't have the bride is the bridegroom we belong to jesus christ but also it is a tremendous truth that is taught throughout the rest of the new testament Behold, I come quickly. And uh, the bridegroom is coming. And uh, we need to be ready and know that we're part of the bride, that we belong to him when he does come. Because he's going to show up. 
And when he does, is the wedding is on then. I mean, it is, it's no time to get ready then. It, the wedding is on. When he walks in, he says, I'm ready to grab my bride and let's get to the house. And uh, it's over with then. And so when that time comes, right now, we're just espoused to the Lord. We belong to him. But the wedding feast is not going to take place until he comes and gets us. We've been espousing. The Holy Spirit has engaged us into the Lord Jesus Christ. We're sealed. I mean, even more so than that Old Testament engagement period was a bond. So much so that Joseph thought that Mary had been unfaithful to him and he was going to have to seal right her uh, bill of divorcement. Even though they were just engaged, they had never consummated their marriage. They had never asked to be married. But in the Jewish culture, that engagement period, it was a binding thing. You couldn't just get out of that thing. I mean, she could just throw that ring back in your face and say, I don't want you. No, I mean, it was a serious, it was as if you were already married. We are still tired of that in the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, when I asked Jesus Christ to save my soul, Boy, the Holy Spirit locked me into that engagement period. I mean, I'm engaged. I'm sealed to be married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the, when that bridegroom comes, the, the bride belongs to him. He's already have been sealed and he's already got us in, in, in his control. Wow. Let's pray. Amen. 730. And Brother Lyle, did that thing ever, do you have any of them come tonight? Three. Well, that, that thing didn't heat up still and Oh, I cracked it up a little bit earlier than that. <laughs> oh, let's pray then. Father, thank you again for the tremendous truths of your word. Lord, thank you that we have a bridegroom. And man, we can just go on describing this bridegroom. Man, he, he has everything. Well, what he offers us is just amazing. Man, when that servant went and offered to Rebecca, the bride for Isaac, all the wealth of Abraham. And he said to that bride, everything that my master has, he's given it to his son, Isaac. And if you marry him, you got it all, Rebecca. Everything that my master has. But when we got Jesus, Father, we got everything. Uh, what a bridegroom. Lord, dismiss us. Help us again to be a good testimony throughout the week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.